Good evening, everyone. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Let me just um, try to, can I spotlight myself? No, I don't think I can. Um, anyway, good evening. Welcome. So glad to see you all here. It's always nice that you guys come because in a way you could wait for the video. And the fact that you actually come live is great because it gives me a sort of a, a sense of, even though it's not much of a Q&A at the end of this, it does give me a sense of kind of connection with you in a, in a live setting in a way that perhaps if I was just recording it to a video I wouldn't have. So I really, really appreciate you and uh, giving me the context in a way to, to talk in this way. So thank you. Um, this session is going to be looking at the integrative stance within transformative coaching. And as with all of these talks, we have an hour together. I, I have a suspicion this might be a little bit shorter than previous ones, in which case we might have a bit more time for Q&A, but we'll see. You never know. Once my, once my math starts working, it just doesn't seem to stop. So you never know. It might get to an, an hour and, you know, we just don't have time for questions, but let's see. I'm going to go straight to the presentation. I need to share my screen first. Okay. All right. Everybody seeing that? Let me just uh, do a little check in there. So give me a little thumbs up. Thank you so much. That's great. All right, good. So integrating what and how the integrative stance in transformative coaching. And I think what we'll do again is just orient ourselves to where we've got to on our five animus principles of transformative coaching. And oh, actually, before I do that, I always forget to introduce myself. So for those of you who don't know me, um, for those of you who are coming to this thinking, well, never heard of this Nick Bolton, but I'll give this talk a try. I am Nick Bolton. I'm the, the, I'm the uh, founder of Anima Centre for Coaching and the International Centre for Coaching Supervision. And these lectures are all part of a mission for me to personally dive deeper into what we mean by transformative coaching here at Anima Centre for Coaching. And interestingly enough, what I've noticed is the more I, I kind of dive into my personal experience of this, the clearer it gets to me. Because I think sometimes we have a notion of what we're doing but we don't necessarily take the time to really dig into it and figure out what's the intellectual archaeology of what's led to where we are. We kind of see the ruins, uh, or maybe not the ruins, but we see the edifice of, of, of what we created, but um, we haven't really taken a, a, a sort of a deep look at what's underneath it. So that's what this, this whole series of talks is about. And if we orient ourselves to where we've got to, this is our model that you've probably getting used to seeing now. We have the phenomenological heart, we have the humanistic, the holistic and systemic, the psychological and the integrative principles. And we're slightly out of order because we started with the humanistic and then we went to holistic and systemic. And then I went on holiday and I realized I couldn't deliver the psychological uh, session uh, from my holiday. And so we've skipped on to the integrative and we'll be coming back to psychological and, and phenomenological over the next few weeks. So we're now getting to, getting to this outer ring, the integrative um, principle of transformative coaching and that's where we're going to be spending our time today. So what we're going to cover is what do we mean by integrative, why this principle is so important or at least why it exists within our framework, what led to it existing. We'll take a look at integrative versus pluralist and eclectic. We'll take a look at the unifying theoretical stance behind transformative coaching, uh, the risks of of integration and critiques of integration, along with some exploration of risk mitigation, let's say, and developing your own integrative framework. And I've, I've, what I'd love to end on is this, almost like a curiosity for you to be asking yourselves, how do you begin to take this forward for yourself? I mean, at one simple level, you could do a plug and play where you take the animas approach and say, well, that works for me. But I suspect in most cases, you really need to do some work to figure out what does integration mean for you? And what does your integrative framework look like if it's going to be authentic to you? So first of all, let's take a look at what do we mean by the integrative stance? I'm just going to switch over to see a few faces. It's kind of nice to see some faces and I, I lost them for a minute. So I'm just going to move you up there. There you go. So what do we mean by the integrative stance? Well, at Animas, what we mean is the integrative stance is an open attitude towards ideas, models, practices, and theoretical frameworks that seeks to draw upon whatever would be most useful for the client. And this is the important part here, but built on top of a unifying theory of change, in our case, transformative, and a core purpose for, for us, emancipation. 
So let me take a look at that again. At Animas, the integrative stance is an open attitude towards ideas, models, practices, and theoretical frameworks that seeks to draw upon whatever will be most useful for the client, but built on top of a unifying theory of change, in our case, transformative, and a core purpose for us, emancipation. And I'll come back to that, that particular aspect of transformative and emancipation as we go through. But I think the first thing to say is integration is about building on top of a core theory. Integration is not simply an amalgamation of whatever lights your fire, whatever you find tucked away in the chest somewhere. It's, it's coming from a place that fits into, plugs into, connects with a central concept that you make your own. And that could be the Animas concept, it could be a different concept, but fundamentally, if you're going to act in an integrative fashion rather than purely eclectic fashion, then it's really connecting to that unifying theory of change. So why this principle is so important to us? Why, why did I make it such a core part? It's, it's the fifth of the five principles that surround the transformative approach to Animas. And you might say, well, it seems a little bit strange that that's such a core principle. I mean, okay, fair enough. They integrate different models, but why is it a principle? Why, why does it become a principle rather than just a, a useful uh, approach? Well, I think it matters to us because if we take a look at going back to this, these five, uh, five principles, at the heart of all that is the phenomenological stance or the ph phenomenological principle. And what that means is that what matters most in all of this is the client's experience. And so we put the client's experience at the heart of change, not some, not some theoretical stance that we take. So rather than saying, well, we come from a psychodynamic approach or we come from a cognitive behavioral approach or we come from a blah, 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 blah approach, what we come from is a client-centered approach that is concerned by the client's phenomenological experience of their life, of their coaching, of what's happening in their mind, what's happening for them somatically. What we're concerned about is the experience of the client. That's so critical. And so with phenomenology being at the very center of our our model, it makes sense that an integrative approach will become critical as a principle, not simply a useful add-on or, or, or an unthought-out process. So that leads us to the epistemological position. Now, I know I like to bandy these words around, but epistemology is simply the study of how we know things. It's the study of knowledge. Not, not the studying of knowledge, as in studying a piece of knowledge, but the study of how we know things. What is the theory of knowledge? And there are different ways of thinking about knowledge. Some people might know things through mystical revelation. Some people might, people might know things through a, a scientific um, process of deduction and falsification. There are different forms of epistemology. And if we take the coaching approach, well, we can say that transformative coaching makes the client's experience central and not a particular psychological model, which we've talked about. And from that, we can say that transformative coaching is fundamentally non-dogmatic. If it's fundamentally non-dogmatic, we are taking a pragmatic approach to knowledge. So the integrative stance is built on a pragmatic epistemology, as in, we don't care what's true, we care what works. We don't care what's true, we care what works. And we'll explore quite soon some of the kind of the challenges around how people have thought about what's true about therapy, what's most effective, and, and the conclusions that most researchers have come to that have really led to a place where you have to say, well, pragmatism is pretty much the only place to go. Unless, unless you're dogmatic because it, it's just your deepest belief about something, pragmatism makes an awful lot of sense in a field in which knowledge is very um, uh, fragmented and it's not, not at all clear if there's, a, if there's a clear foundation for any one particular psychology to, to take precedence. So what is knowable, knowable in, the, in this particular position is simply what works or what is useful for the client. And that's our position, that's it. So if you take nothing from this talk tonight, the one thing I'd love you to take is the ability to rebut people <laughs> who, who say to you, how can you know all these different models? You don't know them all. You're working with what's useful. And if they're not useful, you drop them. And if they are useful, you work with them. It's not about having to be a master of something. You know, it's fascinating. The more I dive into particular strands of psychology, the more you realize the level of nuance within them. And yet we, we talk about them at 
within coaching, we talk about them at quite simple levels. You know, I'm, I'm studying a lot of psychoanalysis at the moment, and you realize that some of the concepts we talk about in terms of projection and projective identification and transference and counter-transference are an awful lot deeper when you start to look into them, but it doesn't matter because the question is, is this a useful metaphor for us to play with in coaching? Does it, does, does thinking about transference or counter-transference or projection or something like that, does it make it useful for the client's experience and, and learning? Not, is it true in its own right? So that's the epistemolog epistemological proposition. And I want to talk now about this, what I call the age of integration. If you look around you today, just take a look around at the world of therapy, at the world of counselling, particularly psychotherapy, and certainly at the world of coaching. And you'll see we are, you, you can see we're in, in an integrative age. Uh, increasingly, schools that teach counselling, psychotherapy and coaching come at it from an integrative perspective. My challenge to that is I'm not convinced that they are fully integrative. I think they are eclectic. And I think it's really important we start to tease out what those mean, and I'll, I'll come to that shortly. But we're definitely in the age of integration. Increasingly, schools of psychology that were once miles apart are beginning to recognise that there's actually more that connects them than that divides them. Even schools such as cognitive behavioural and psychodynamic are beginning to see the use they have for each other. So, Back in 2001, there was a book published called The Great Psychotherapy Debate, uh, Debate by Juan Polt, and he came up with this concept called the dodo bird effect. Now, I don't quite get the dodo, where the dodo bird effect came from. It, it was from something to do with Alice in Wonderland. It was some sort of race. There was a dodo, and I don't quite get that story. It doesn't really matter. Uh, they caught, caught, to me, dodo simply means extinct, but anyway, apparently it's not about that. It's about the fact that in this race in Alice in Wonderland, there was no winner. I don't know if any of you know that story, and if so, if you can back me up, that's great. But the point is that there was some research done that tried to establish which is the most effective psychotherapy. And broadly, what was suggested was that no, no one therapy wins. There's no one approach to psychology or therapy that seems to be more or less effective than another. That was back in 2001. Now, some recent research has begun to question that, but nonetheless, overall, that concept that there is no winner in therapy is still a very dominant concept. And what did seem to matter far more than the specific discipline that any given therapist um, attached themselves to was their commitment to it. It wasn't whether they were a psychodynamic practitioner or a cognitive behavioral practitioner or any other kind of practitioner. It was, it was that they were committed to their practice and they had congruence with their approach and what was communicated was less the specifics of their of their practice but the confidence in the work they did and i think that becomes really important when we start to say well how am i going to work integratively how do i exude and sh and have confidence in my approach to coaching because that seems to be the ingredient it's the relationship that's predicated on confidence in and commitment to a practice and the one thing I've become really, really clear on, and this is this is kind of my take on all of this, is given the endless debates that have raged on for decades in psychology and various therapies, I really don't think it's our role to have to choose one. I, I think that if, if we decide that we're going to fall on the side of, well, cognitive behavioral theory is far more useful than psychodynamic and psychodynamic doesn't work because dot, 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 or vice versa or anything in between, we're simply entering a debate that hasn't yet been solved for, I mean, goodness knows how many years, 60, 70 years in the case of the first two psychologies, psychodynamic and um, behavioral. But then you add in humanistic and then in the 60s, and you're still looking at a good 50 years of debate that hasn't been resolved. I don't think as individuals we need to enter into that debate. I think we can ask ourselves, OK, well, how do we play with these and simply enable them to work together? We don't have to be drawn into, well, I can't do that because this has a different theoretical basis. That's my, that's my um, belief, at least. So let's talk very briefly about integrative versus eclectic and pluralist. And these three terms all come up together, in a sense, and often get muddled together. But I do think they are different. And so for me, integrative is a number of different frameworks but that, that integrate around a core theory. So I put there a broadly coherent framework of thinking that integrates multiple models, practices, and theories. But what's important is they have a unifying theory or a unifying uh, concept. 
around which they work. The eclectic and the pluralist, I honestly can't tell the difference between those two. Maybe there's somebody on this call who can nuance it further, but the more I read, the more it seems like a synonym, uh, eclectic and pluralist. But essentially, it's an approach of using whatever tools are helpful, regardless of underlying assumptions. And as a school, we definitely take an interpretive approach, and I'll share where that comes from and specifically what directs our integration. But I also want to share how you can think about your own integration as you begin to work forward as a coach. I realize I don't know, oh, there's my, my phone, thank you. Phew. I suddenly realized I didn't have a watch on. Um, so let's talk about the uniform, unifying transformative theory that we come from. Now we know that the heart of transformative theory is that transformative change takes place at the level of mental paradigm shift. So what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean, imagine if you were coaching somebody and they wanted to get a new job. And as part of getting their new job, you help them to think about their existing strengths. And with their existing strengths, they go out and get a job that builds on their existing strengths, that essentially continues the pattern for good or bad of their life based on those strengths. That is not transformative change. It's change, but it's not transformative change. Nothing fundamentally has shifted from a perspectival level, from a paradigm level, from a model of the world level, from a whatever level you want to think about in terms of that mental model. And I was thinking about this, I was walking last weekend and I, my brain just keeps, first day of walking, my brain just keeps thinking to itself and I'm trying to be mindful about walking and I can't because my brain just thinks and thinks. And then day two, my brain finally goes, enough thinking, enjoy the walk. But on this first day, I was walking along and I was thinking about the, the chronology of change. And if you are coaching, and the cause of the ultimate change from the coaching is a psychological shift, then you could argue that at some level there's been a transformative change. So you have problem stroke desire, you have coaching intervention, you have mental shift, you have outcome. That's transformative coaching. But if you switch that chronology and you say you have problem stroke desire, you have coaching intervention, you have outcome, you have, you have psychological shift as a byproduct, potentially, of the outcome. That's not transformative coaching. It might be transformative change as a byproduct, but it's not transformative coaching because you are working without a paradigm shift as part of the outcome. Let me try to get that in even clearer terms. Imagine, for instance, that you've coached somebody about getting a new job. You work on all their existing paradigmatic frameworks. They keep the same thoughts, they keep the same beliefs, they keep the same feelings, they keep everything stays the same and they get the new job. But when they get to the new job, they're in a new context and that new context provides them with new opportunities to think and to experience themselves anew. And they suddenly realize they weren't the person they thought they were or other people aren't the way they think they are. And all of a sudden, bang, transformation happens. But it was a result of the outcome, not a result of the coaching. I wonder if that Makes sense. I hope it does. And so if the heart of transformative theory is that transformative change takes place at the level of mental paradigm shift, that becomes the unifying theory for us. Anything we do within Animas because we're a transformative coaching school is not just about what creates change per se, but rather what creates transformative change. So the unifying theory is, is that the approach that fits the transformative model enables rethinking and reconceptualization of one's worldview, paradigm, or perspective. Anything we do at Animas fundamentally should be allowing for the reconceptualization of one's worldview, paradigm, or perspective. And it's one of the reasons why there are certain things that over the years I've dropped away from Animas. Years ago, many, many years ago, 2008, 2009, one of the modules we used to talk, teach was called NLP and coaching. And over the years, I dropped NLP away. And part of the reason for that was that NLP, whilst it can create transformative change, it doesn't create it at the level of reconceptualization. It changes it at the level of experience. In other words, we changed somebody's experience of the world through dulling down colors, increasing colors, making a picture bigger, making a picture smaller. We change what is called an NLP, the submodalities of an experience, 
but not the actual paradigm and understanding of the experience. And I started to think that's not what animas means to me. Animas is a is a deliberate reconceptualization in a very meaningful sense of one's worldview or paradigm or experience of a particular thing that we can make meaning of versus simply changing the immediacy of the experience, which is what NLP does. If you have a phobia, it doesn't particularly help you think through the phobia. It changes your experience of the phobia through changing the way you imagine the spider, the, 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 the tight lift or whatever it might be. And so, and to my mind, that didn't feel transformative. So it slowly dropped away. Likewise, mindfulness. And then, by the way, I know when I say mindfulness, there'll be people jumping up and screaming. Mindfulness is transformative. It might well be. But I think often mindfulness is treated in a way that's about a coping mechanism for one's woes rather than a transformative change to one's life. And I think that's why, for me, mindfulness has never entered into, into Animas as a very deliberate part of our coaching. And so... Building on that, transformative coaching is an emancipatory practice, not a coping mechanism. Last week, sorry, two weeks ago, I talked about the idea of, of um, transformative coaching and the systemic and holistic principle. And what I showed was this concept of the fish in the water and that the transformative process is helping the fish see the water it's in. And by seeing it, it gets emancipated from the unconscious, uh, unconscious, um, being part of that system without an awareness of it is a little bit like in the matrix when neo finally becomes aware of the fact that it really is a, a virtual reality world that he was part of even though it's attractive this is the real world the, the red pill blue pill thing that's emancipation and uh, it comes it comes from a lot of the work of critical theorists like habermas and so on but fundamentally it's really looking at how do we emancipate people from the cultural assumptions that they are born into and assumed to be true and that emancipation by the way doesn't have to be as large as hegemonic systems it can be as simple as the family you're brought up in what, what do you assume to be true for your potential given the family you're brought up in or the relationship you're part of or the workplace you're part of or the location within the uk you're part of or the location the, within korea you're part of or, you know it, it can be a lot smaller than simply this idea of emancipation from the whole system. No, it could be emancipation from a given experience of your individual life. And so transformative coaching is an emancipatory practice. How do we help somebody see the constraints and shackles they put on themselves unconsciously through the systems they're part of? My goodness, I hope this is all making sense because I realize I'm rattling away here. And then finally, um, in terms of the unifying transformative theory, and I've sort of alluded to this already, some approaches lend themselves more to transformative whilst others lend themselves more to the instrumental or to the self-regulatory. And what I mean by that is, and I hope it's coming clear now, that some of the approaches that exist within the coaching field are about opening up somebody's ability to reconceptualize their experience. Others are simply, how do I get my, my next career move? How do I get my next partner? How do I dot, dot, dot? That's what Jack Mesereau, the founder of Transformative Learning, founder, first person that kind of talked about that anyway, um, would call instrumental learning. It's, it's learning for a means to an end. And then self-regulation is how do I regulate myself given the conditions I'm in? So I'm in an unhappy marriage. How do I stay calmer in the unhappy marriage? That would be self-regulation. How do I manage my emotions within a given situation without necessarily changing the situation itself? So the unifying transformative theory for us is, is that set of, of kind of concepts there that we are always trying to lock in, or plug in, let's say, plug in approaches that create mental paradigm shift. However, all that said, there's no question in my mind, and I've, I've really struggled with this over years, the number of times I've thought, let's strip everything out. Let's strip out the cognitive behavioral coaching and let's strip out the TA. It's too much. Because there are certain risks that come with the integrative approach and there are critiques that exist around it which are worth exploring. And the first one is a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Uh, you know if we think about some of the um, some of the psychologies that are being drawn into coaching nowadays it can be very easy to think you've understood them and yet you're really tinkering at the very superficial level but thinking that you've got it. So, you know, we've taught transactional analysis for years, 
But transactional analysis can, can go deeper and deeper and deeper in terms of how you practice it. The risk is we think we've got it. We think that we've nailed it. We think once we've understood ego states and transactions and games and strokes and life scripts and life positions, bang, you're a TA practitioner. Well, no, you've got a certain framework that can be used to create new ways of thinking, but you're a long way from being a, a bona fide transactional analysis, let's say. And, and I think there's a real risk that we think we've understood something and we start going places that we really shouldn't be going. And that leads to a sort of jack of all trades mentality where you're not really mastering any one thing. You are, you are simply kind of thinking about how do I learn another thing? How do I learn another thing? How does my jigsaw get bigger rather than how does my jigsaw get more beautiful? And all of this, in a sense, leads to a risk of crossing boundaries. And one of the things I've got very concerned about, and I know, I'm not sure how many people on this call, but I, I guarantee there'll be people on this call who are interested in trauma. I just know it because I see it increasingly uh, in the coaching world. And that worries me a bit. I, I can understand the interest. I really can understand the interest, but it worries me because I notice how many coaches are drawn to trauma. And then when I think about this concept of shadow, what the, the shadow in the work we do, what's, what's the shadow in the work we do as practitioners? I often wonder what's the shadow that makes trauma seem attractive to a practitioner? And what is, what is that that's drawing them? And how are they then making sure that they're not being drawn into their own attraction towards something? And I often think of trauma being like the bright flower in a field that an awful lot of bees are buzzing towards. I don't know, it worries me a little bit. And I think sometimes the risk of integration is that we suddenly feel able to do some of the deeper work that perhaps we're not yet ready to do. You know, I, I, um, I've just, I'm working on a blog post at the moment that's really about the idea that initial coach training is just that initial coach training it isn't the end of your journey you know where you, you there's a lifelong journey to be a coach and to keep improving as a coach and i've been training as a coach since 2004 you know and i'm, I'm going through two courses at the moment there's, a, there's an ongoing journey to grow as a coach and sometimes i feel like the the concept is i do my initial coach training bob's your uncle i'm done we have to be really careful of that so and the integrative principle can lead to that that feeling that you're ready to, to start doing deeper work flip side is it can also be very overwhelming to learn multiple models it's like i've just learned cognitive behavioral coaching now i've got to learn what transactional analysis oh my goodness and what now narrative and it can be a little bit overwhelming in terms of as a new coach you know i mean it depends on your background if you've come from a world of psychology and therapy and counseling it's sometimes easier to take on these models but if you're brand new to coaching, it can be a little bit overwhelming to suddenly think, my goodness, I thought I was just going to be asking Socratic questions. But here I am thinking about life scripts. What's going on? So there's definitely an overwhelming aspect to it, which I'll come back to shortly. I also think there's the potential for confusion and for clashing assumptions, by which I mean that sometimes some of these principles that we can integrate into Animas in particular, but you might integrate other things can have very different underlying assumptions about the way people change and the way people operate and the assumptions about how people grow. It can have very different assumptions about the values that drive people. So if you look at something like psychodynamic concepts around the, the des desires, if you take a Lacanian position on, on psychodynamic coaching, for instance, you'll be looking at a very different way of thinking about humans. And if you look at a cognitive, cognitive behavioral approach, and sometimes the underlying assumptions that are playing there can actually be quite confusing both for the client and for the coach if they all get a little bit muddled up and you've got like a kind of a i don't know a, an apple an apple strudel with gravy poured over it you know you've got to be a little bit careful about how you begin to to mesh these things together and then the final one is falling into diagnosis and this is something that i've seen happen when you know let's be honest integrative approaches typically integrate from the world of psychotherapy and, and wider psychology. And as a result, it draws in the potential for diagnosis. And as coaches, we never diagnose. In fact, I would say the minute diagnosis starts, coaching stops. And yet at the same time, when we have models like transactional analysis, it can be very easy to go, ah, I know this. This is a, a structured parent whose ego state's been evoked by the by the cooperative child you know it's like job done i've diagnosed you we have to be very careful of that it can be very easy to do but we have to 
step back. So let's think about what, how do we mitigate those risks? First thing is I would treat theories and narratives, uh, sorry, treat theories as narratives and metaphors. And that's a very postmodern stance. It's simply what is the most useful narrative we can take here to help this person think through their current dilemma. So instead of thinking that this psychodynamic interpretation holds some actual truth, what we're actually saying is, does this psychodynamic interpretation offer a story that enables you to rethink your experience in some way? We could be thinking about, does this approach to narrative uh, coaching offer a way of thinking about your life that is more or less useful than taking a more structured cognitive behavioral approach or whatever it might be that begins to fill up your integrative approach. So one way I would definitely suggest is we risk, uh, we mitigate the risk is by treating everything from a postmodern stance of narrative and metaphor rather than have, ha as having some positivist truth that can be scientifically you know, uh, measured and falsified. Second up, and I think this is related and um, incredibly important for us as coaches, is to only use theories and models to facilitate the client's thinking. You know, the, when you find yourself beginning to describe the client's experience through a model, then that's tantamount to diagnosis. And you can pull yourself back. And it's okay to name that. Wow, I just found myself diagnosing you. That's not my job. H how do we engage with this more usefully? What do you think of this? Does that, does that in some way hold some weight for you? What, what might be useful for you to think through in this? And all you're doing is you're offering it, you're facilitating it as a way, as a creative endeavor for them to think about their dilemma. And I would kind of sum that up with lightly held, lightly offered. I think that's a nice, a nice little um, way of thinking about this. And then think about integration as a stance, not as an ambition or a metric of progress. What I mean by that is that if we think of integration as purely how I'm going to come into and be as a coach, rather than it's something I've got to do, the more I integrate, the better I am. The more models I learn, the more qualifications I plug in, the more of a metric of my success that shows me I'm having. No, none of that. Integration is a stance, it's a mental stance of what's useful here and what supports the unifying theory. And then finally, supervision. Now I put there that transformative coaches should be in supervision. And I put the, sh the word should in italics because nobody likes to be shoulded, let's be honest. But I do think that transformative coaches are a somewhat different breed from say an organizational coach that's coaching team members on goal achievement within the team. As a transformative coach, you are at some level very deliberately helping somebody rethink, reconceptualize, shift their perspective on some of the deepest parts of their life. Now that might be in the workplace, but it's still about their relationship to something, their relationship to themselves, to their employees, to their boss, to their system, to whatever it might be, you're helping them rethink a relationship too. And as transformative coaches, that comes with a huge deal of responsibility. And I honestly think that transformative coaches should be in supervision, but I do find myself bulking out that word should, I must admit. But I'll, 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 I'll lightly hold it and I'll offer it lightly. But I do think supervision is certainly something that all transformative coaches should be thinking about. Okay, so as we begin to move into this, has, this is actually quite a short lecture, actually, which is quite nice. We might get a bit more Q&A time. But as we as we think about the coming into the, um, the end, I'm going to look at integration made personal and offer you a way of thinking about how you can begin to develop your own integrative model. That is very sound as opposed to simply just an eclectic amalgamation of models. So if you take a look at, oh, that's gone a bit funny. Oh, I know what it is. There we go. <laughs> um, if we take a look at what I might call the meta model for integrative practice, it really looks something like this. In the heart, you've got the unifying theory. And then around the unifying theory, you have the purpose of the coaching. And around the purpose of the coaching, you have the principles of practice. 
And around the principles of practice, you have the approaches that are, if you like, if you like proceduralizing the coaching. In other words, what's taking place in the coaching? What, what are the tools, models, frameworks that are being utilized? And so if I share the Animas model, it looks like this. The unifying theory is transformative practice. The purpose is emancipatory, spelt wrong, apologies for that. <laughs> emancipatory self-reflection and empowerment. It's emancipating the individual through a process of self-reflection from the system that they are being constrained by and empowering them to take action from a new mental model. That's the purpose of transformative coaching from an animas perspective. Then we have the principles of practice, which you are looking at now, the five principles, phenomenological, systemic and holistic, psychological, humanistic, and integrative. Those are the principles of practice that guide how we think about how do we put this into the world? And then finally, you know, they have the models and approaches and they could be anything so long as they fit the three preceding levels. And so for us within the course itself, in terms of level one, at least, well, level one and level two coming is you have CBC, cognitive behavioral coaching, you have transactional analysis, you have narrative, you have worldview psychology and solution focus. Now in later levels, we're going to be adding psychodynamic, which, which is certainly adds a whole new dimension of thinking about the self. Um, but nonetheless, the, the first one, two, three, four, five, five are really core to the current level one course. And so then you can think, well, what's your integrative model? Because it doesn't have to be the Animas one. By the way, you could say, yep, that'll do me nicely. I'll take that. Thank you, Mr. Bolton. I'll have the Animas model and I'll use it. And great. Go for it. It's, you're welcome to fully adopt what we do. But we're an emancipatory school, which means as you come through Animas, we want to emancipate you from Animas. We want you to be thinking for yourself about what you really experience as a coach. What really works for you? I had a great conversation today with a coach who said that, that she wasn't counting some of her hours that she'd coached because sometimes she would find that five, 10 minutes might be more personal, talking about cats and that sort of thing. And I said, well, look, don't send that kind of session into Animas as, for your qualification because it's not going to pass. But that might be who you are as a coach. Don't feel you've got to get rid of that. That, that five minutes, 10 minutes, a beautiful personal connection that's got nothing to do with the goal achievement, the, the, the focus of the coaching might be what that human being needs. And that, that particular coach might be so well placed to give somebody five, 10 minutes of non-coaching space within a coaching space. That might be what becomes part of their integrative practice. And so I want to emancipate you from the Animas model and set you free. So here's what I would suggest is that you think about your, your unifying theory and the question you can ask yourself is what connects everything you do and think in coaching and what do you believe to be true? For me, I believe that change happens most profoundly at the transformative level, but you might not believe that. You might have joined Animas and get halfway through and say, ha, this transformation approach is really annoying. I much prefer a simple performance approach. Great. So you start to think about your unifying theory is that change happens best when you act into the world and get results, for instance. Then you think about your purpose. What is your core aim with coaching as emancip emancipatory self-reflection leading to empowerment? What is your core aim? It could be to you know, live more happily with your circumstances. Perfectly great outcome, not necessarily transformative, potentially transformative from an internal perspective. Um, but nonetheless, you get my point. It's you've got to decide for yourself, what is your core aim with your coaching? And then your principles of practice, what guides how you implement practice? What's going to be important to you? And then finally, what models and approaches make up your skill set? And there are so many. I mean, goodness me, when I look across my faculty who teach our course, they're not all clones of me, I can assure you, they're really not. I mean, it's really interesting how my faculty deliver my course, but as practitioners, they are often so different, using things like mindfulness or clean language or shadow work or all sorts of stuff, that each different, they all bring their own unique interests, skill sets, and ways of thinking about coaching. 
And so that brings us to the, the end of the content part, integrating what and how. I hope that was helpful and useful. What I'm going to do now is... Uh...